I'll introduce Tom van Tilburg, if I pronounce it correctly, and he's going to show us a market of Netherlands automatically from point clouds. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have to admit something. I didn't prepare the timing for this one. I have no clue how long it takes. So please, if we are halfway, do <coughs> and then I know I have to speed up. <coughs> okay. Um, there was a little text going with the presentation, so you have an idea what it's about. Um, mainly it's about getting data from point clouds um, into uh, a processing pipeline and then returning a market for the whole country. But first, what is a market? Um, myself, I thought it was just a, everybody has a kind of idea what a market might be. Um, if you look it up, it's a small model used by a sculptor before beginning the real work of art. I'm not sure if that really fits what I wanted it to do, but this is what I have in mind with a market. And I think most people know it, they've seen it at some point. Uh, so what I want to create is um, something that looks like your surrounding, but is, is not perfectly like your surrounding. But at least it's a beginning of a stage, a kind of canvas, if you will, to continue drawing on. Now what is in our market, the one we're making? Um, there is a whole list of options, of, of types of buildings you can choose from and level of detail. This one I, um, I took from work from the University of Delft, um, where they uh, set out a nice list of, uh, of options. We chose to go for this level, level of detail 2.2, which means if you put buildings in it, the dormers will be there, uh, any extensions will be there, but there's no overhanging features in it. Uh, for the terrain, um, I took this from the ESRI website. Um, it's actually the manual on how to make terrains. Uh, Esri has quite a nice um, manual on how to make uh, uh, elevation models. So you see brake lines. Brake lines is the key feature here, what we want to make. Okay, what goes into um, the model? Um, first of all, Netherlands is not a very big country, but we do have a point cloud for the whole country. That's a lot of data. Uh, that's about three terabytes if you compress it. Uh, if you decompress it, depends a bit on, uh, on what's in it. Uh, you go to roughly 30 terabytes. I never tried myself to decompress, but that's what you might end up. Uh, we use um, Entwine and Poodle to process it. Um, together with um, uh, building footprints, it helps if you already know the footprints of the buildings. Luckily in the Netherlands we have all the building footprints, or at least where they should be and we put them into PostJS, 10 million of them. Now, to give you an idea what is in that point cloud of the Netherlands, this is a, a short abstract we made. Um, this is uh, in the west of the country, close to Amsterdam. Uh, it's an industrial area, and you get an idea of the quality of the roof data in it. So look at the roofs, you see here there's some, um, you can obviously see the lines. I faked it a bit with the color images on it. The color image is not really in the data, it is superimposed later on. Uh, what you'll see happening is soon it will get into less colors. Yeah, this is the real data. So you see buildings have been already extracted from this point cloud. That's very useful. We have a luxury position here. A premise. Um, we use a database to do most of the work. Why a database? Because you can also run all your things in, in Python or whatever processing language you like. Because it's so much data, um, we or I at least feel more comfortable keeping it all together in a database, um, and that database will solve all my indexing problems. Uh, and, and you can do a lot, which I'll show. We have only one option, serious option for that, which will be PostJS and Postgres to run on. Um, about point clouds in the database, now the obvious first um, thing that pops onto mind is PG Point Cloud. Uh, we tried working with PG Point Cloud, which um, is really great for a, a lot of things, um, but it's a little bit tedious to get your data into it. Uh, so in the end, um, we chose to use it directly from Entwine Point Tiles, EPT. Um, and that works because you can use Python in your database. Now, and I hope you're not afraid of a bit of code, because I put in a lot of code, actually. Um, who of you knows SQL? Okay, I'm on the safe side. <laughs> um, there's actually more Python than SQL in it, but what you see here is a procedural um, uh, language implementation of Python. Um, uh, all the way on the top, do I have a pointer? 
Maybe not, I don't know. Um, all the way in the top, it's a little bit SQL, it creates a function, and then for the rest, it's all uh, Python until down there, where it returns um, your points. And what it actually does, it builds a, a, a small Poodle reader. Uh, it reads from the uh, EPT data and returns the points for you in a nice table format. Uh, oh yeah, and the input will be, you, you put a footprint of the building, and it will cut out exactly where you have that footprint. So that's the result. Done. And th this is the query that actually is run. So you, you, you give your geometry with it, your footprint geometry, and you say, the e this is the location of my points. And then you get that. You get a, a little building here with, uh, you see, a, obviously, a lighter points over there with heights on it. This is 3D view. So indeed, we got the roof of a certain building. Now, how to recognize this roof as an, as an object? Again, we use Python. Um, ASCII-learn. As K learn, uh, has a lot of features to do clustering on your points, uh, which is very useful. In this case, we used um, a density-based um, cluster scan, um, which is just four lines of codes in your SQL environment. And then you have the clustering on your points, which results in this. You saw the color change, maybe. Now we have two clusters of, of points, which show uh, two sides of the roof. It's a gable roof. And, and, and it's this simple, it's just this query you run in the end for every building. A little bit more complex building, uh, just to show you an idea <laughs> where you go to. So you start with this, actually it's a, it's a hospital with lots of uh, things on the roof and you go to this kind of segmentation. Of course the trick is to get rid of all the, the noise and the, the points you don't need. And, uh, and from there you continue building your buildings. Okay. An important part where we spend a lot of effort on. Uh, one of my colleagues built a, a nice library um, to find what actually is the shape of all these points. Now you have your clusters, two of them, two colors, and you want to know what, what, what kind of shape is in this cluster. Now these points are very nice. Uh, you, you can see almost exactly how the roof shape should look like, but you also see that the the actual finding the boundary is difficult because you see it starts cutting corners where it thinks the points are not really part of the, the roof. Um, it looks like this, and to go very quickly through the process, uh, this is what it does. Uh, it takes your points of either a building or a, a roof. It tries to find the segments into it, which is an, a kind of simplification it does. It tries to regularize according to the shapes it already knows of the building. It knows that probably if it is like one, two degrees difference with the, the wall, it has to fit along that wall. So that does what it does. And in the end, it fits a kind of model to it, which is likely the, the roof shape in this case. And this is the end result. You can check it with the points again, and then it, it's supposed to fit. It usually depends on the quality of your points, of course. I'll com come back to that later. Just have an idea how am I doing in the time? I'm perfect, okay. Maybe I'll do a bit easier then. Um, okay, now we got um, clusters of points. We got a, a kind of the idea of the roof shape, but this is not perfect at all because it will be quite messy if you just implement this uh, straight away. So you need to do a couple of more steps to it. Um, topology is a great way to go. If you have a topological correct um, roof, a set of roof polygons, um, it becomes more easy to work with because you can start moving vertices around uh, without uh, having to be afraid that your damage you make some kind of slivers of holes in it. So topology is the way to go. Um, and how do you create an easy topology of the roof? To start with, you do Voronoi polygons. Voronoi polygons will kind of fill up the space in your roof or in your building. Um, and you can apply I hope I have a picture. Yeah, I do. Um, you can apply the, the, the classifications to those polygons, and then you have a kind of poor man's segmentation. Um, so the effect is this. This is a lot of uh, Voronoi polygons around my points. And uh, what you uh, consecutively do, and I hope, yeah, I wrote it there. We use another procedural language in the database, which is JavaScript, because there's a couple of great JavaScript libraries to do um, topology simplification. Uh, it's actually based on the, the topo JSON um, code. And what happens next is that you see it's being 
merge it first, and on top of that merge is a simplify. And then you start seeing the roof shape, although far from perfect, because the, the middle of the roof is, is very rough. So we need to do a little bit of fitting. Now, how can you fit this? In case of a, a roof which looks like this, it's easy, because you know it has a perfect um, intersection line on the top. Like that, you visualize it. So you can find that intersection line. You can be sure that the intersection line will be the place where the points meet, and you can draw a line like this is the separation between my two roof parts. So that's exactly what we do. These are the vertices we found on the roof. We snap them to um, a center line, and you get to a shape that looks like a very regular roof. Now, there's one uh, caveat. Snapping is no fun. Try to avoid it. Um, I think we spent about half of our time to get the snapping right, and it's still not right. Um, uh, snapping is a horrible thing to do. Uh, if I would do it again, maybe I would try to avoid it completely, but we got into it over our neck, so we have to kind of continue with it. Um, but uh, yeah, I can tell you for another couple of hours on, on, on snapping. I will not do that. Okay, we got planes. Um, from the top, you saw it looked like a, a roof shape. Now, how to get a building out of that? Um, it is not as easy as it seemed at first because you cannot do a simple extrude. Uh, extrude would create a lot of um, boxes, uh, especially if you do a post as extrude. Um, a lot of boxes that, that go to the ground but are not, not, not flat on the ground. Also, what you actually want to do if you have different levels of roof, you want to connect the levels to each other instead of to the ground. Um, luckily, we use topology. If your data is still topology correct, it is not very difficult to connect two parts which are like this, separated to each other. So you have a wall in between them. And then this is more or less the end result for a simple building. You see what I mean with connecting the roofs, if it turns a bit more. Yeah, this part, you see, is it's connecting only uh, two levels of roofs. Now, you get a couple of things for free once you have this. You have a lot of data on it, so you can calculate volume, area. You can calculate how it's connecting with neighboring houses. Um, that might be interesting for things like energy consumption, um, how many solar panels you can put on your roof, that kind of thing. So this is already very useful stuff. But this is just one building. And how long did that take? Nah, this little building might be just under 10 seconds. If we get into that hospital you saw first, you might get more close to one minute. It depends a bit on the size. Uh, but there's a minimum of 115 days if you want to run the whole country. Uh, that's a single CPU though, so we might speed that up. Um, but we hope to get it also running a bit faster because there's definitely some bottlenecks we can tackle. <coughs> Okay, this is, I, I was actually, months ago, when I was sending in the abstract for this presentation, I thought, okay, I'll show you the whole Netherlands, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you recognize the city, maybe? It's the city of Amsterdam. This is as far as I got up to now. Um, that's mainly due to the snapping. Uh, I've been improving and improving until the last week, so I've been running it now for, uh, for a couple of days, and this is, uh, this is what we have. Uh, I'll show you the real result of this later. Um, and about some of the issues, um, and I think people who work with point clouds will recognize this. Um, if you have water on your roofs, <laughs> you have no points. We have a lot of water on roofs because they always fly in the winter and there's always rain and it's cold and the water never evaporates, so there's always water. If you have ceramic roofs or plastic tiles on them, they scatter the signal. It's gone. You have no roof or no points. This is the situation in Amsterdam for one out of three houses. <laughs> Actually, people pay a lot. This is, this is really rich people living there. They pay a lot of money to put this on top of their house. Uh, but we can't do anything with it. If you look at Google Maps, Google also tried to do their best. You also see it's, it's a lot of triangles they made there. Okay, this, this is not a serious picture, of course, but overhanging <laughs> trees are are a problem. Uh, my own house is under a, a, a pretty big and pretty large tree, and though they shoot it in the winter, the, the, still, the, the big trees take away a lot of points. And to do your clustering, you need some statistics and you need some density of points. And this poses a problem. Okay, now I've been talking about buildings all the time, but how about the terrain? 
maybe you know the situation in the Netherlands. Um, I think about 75% of the country looks as flat as this. Um, so actually, the terrain becomes more important because when it's this flat, you want to see every little detail that might be available. And there's another reason, which is this thing. There's a lot of dikes in the country. Uh, dikes you want to have properly modeled, um, not just roughly, because what you get is some triangles will cut corners and then you, you miss the, the angle of the dike, for instance. So for us, it's utterly important that we find this kind of lines in the data. And we do that first. So this is a DM of this, uh, the, same, the same dike. Uh, of course, more yellow is higher. And you see these lines are the, the foot lines and the top lines of the dike. And, uh, and between them, you can triangulate and then you have a kind of, kind of um, tin. This would be the end result. So that's not bad. Now to compare, we also uh, put the same data into, uh, for instance, for example, cesium iron platform. Uh, which does a great job. It is a very nice uh, uh, detailed terrain, uh, but it's a lot of triangles. If you compare this to, if you do only with the brake lines, with at least the triangles, you go to this, it, uh, it doesn't look nice, but believe me, it's the same area, and if you drape your image over this, it will look the same. It's a lot less triangles. So from here to here. That's good for your performance. Um, now, how to put all this together, because you want to see the data in the end. Uh, we wrote a, a little um, tool for that. It's running in Docker. And it's uh, what it does for you, it processes all your roofs or whatever 3D polygons you have in the database into 3D tiles. Um, takes a bit of time still. This was only Amsterdam. We are working on that. Um, this is your um, triangles. As I said, you do a triangulate in your database, and those break lines get triangulated in a nice mesh uh, which forms your landscape. And you export that into um, quantized mesh tiles. Works very well with cesium. I don't expect you to memorize any of this, by the way. Only a triangulation. OK. <laughs> I usually try to avoid this, but there's no other way. It already goes wrong. I was supposed to click on it, but I don't think anything happens here. No, you see? So I'll open a new site. Yes, that's what I wanted to show. OK, uh, stupidly enough, I let the debug option on this morning. I just recognized. Uh, so all those white lines you see are not supposed to be there. Um, but what happens is that all of that area in Amsterdam, um, which you saw in, um, in, in red in the beginning, is now 3D tiles. Uh, I'll zoom in a little. I'm taking my favorite part, of course, not the part that gone all wrong. OK, and th this, is, this is roughly the effect of that process. It's completely automized, so there's no handwork in it. Um, still, you have to imagine about 10 seconds per building, um, more big buildings. And we try to get to the level of dormers. Um, dormers are especially tedious because that's where the water is on. Um, so you see some of them go horribly wrong. Uh, the easiest part is if the, the roofs are like, uh, like skew, as you see here. It gets more difficult once they are straight. So here's the, the hospital you saw first. You see there's a little bit of, of, of clutter on the roof. Uh, we still have to get rid of that. Um, uh, actually, the most difficult part is simplifying your geometries uh, in a way that doesn't damage too much. Um, also, what's very difficult is on, on this kind of houses, you want to keep a very small scale. You want to see all the dormers. If you go to this kind of buildings, where an air conditioning unit is already the size of two dormers, um, you kind of want to get rid of that, that kind of air conditioning unit. Uh, that makes it um, hard to do. Um, and I think most of the time went into, into that kind of process, into making it simple. OK, you can see this uh, result yourself. I'll share the link later. Uh, let's see if I can go back. Yes. 
Okay. It should have a roadmap, of course. Any project, uh, what do we want to improve? Um, improve, that's one of the, <laughs> the points. What I want, this was my last, last slide and the last minute, obviously. Uh, we want to um, improve the speed um, in which it loads. What you just saw, it, it loads pretty slowly. That's due to um, some over complexity in the terrain and a bit of over complexity in the buildings. We need to cut that out. Uh, it needs to look better. I'm not a UX designer. I'm not a designer at all. Um, I just put some colors on it. Uh, this can be much better, and I'm sure people who are specialized in rendering in, in CZ or other, any other 3D rendering can make a lot nicer job out of it. Um, and not everything you saw is open source yet. Um, the part which is, I will show you later. Um, is, in my opinion, we should try to open source it, source it but from a commercial, commercial perspective, um, it is also a matter of, uh, of, of first trying to find out what you actually want to sell and then, then seeing what you can open source. So as a last slide, this is the part which is open sourced. Uh, first one is, um, first two are how to create the, the boundaries around the points. You can actually get building footprints with that. It's very useful, I think, myself. Uh, we are still working hard on it, but the, the code which is there still runs pretty well. Um, fill the holes in the point clouds. This is what we try to use to fill those um, dormers where water is on the roof. So we just fill up the points, kind of patch it together and then run our statistics. Um, PG to B3DM, it's actually it's a clone. It started as a clone from Pi 3D tiles uh, from Oslandia. Uh, it's written in .NET though, uh, and we wanted to have our own flexibility to make 3D tiles. And the last one is to work with um, um, the topology uh, functionality from G3 in the database. I think that was perfectly in the time. Thank, Thank you, you, Tom. Nice crowd. We have five minutes for questions. Can you do curved roofs? Curved roofs, not straight lines. Uh, you mean if it's like a, like dome structure? Dome structures, yeah. Uh, no. It's hard. <laughs> it's, it's hard. No dome structures. Will, if, if it's a large dome, it will segment properly. So you, you get a kind of segmentation. It looks like all kind of like hexagons, but not necessarily hexagons. Uh, if it's small, it's it's just gone basically. Yeah. What are we using to filter the vegetation out of the canopies? If you saw the slide in the beginning, uh, we were very fortunate that's already been done to, for us. This goes a bit far back, but in that little movie I showed. Ah, right. Yeah, it's already classified. It actually has been done by hand. It's quite an amazing job. Uh, the, the, some, the, it's, it was sent to some countries where you pay less money for doing that kind of handwork. Um, <laughs> And um, uh, they really have been selecting about every point in, where in or out vegetation. Uh, Very good question. Yes. How, how do you like? If you do a Voronoi, you, you obviously lose all your um, 3D information because it just Voronoi's over all your 2D 2D points at the moment. Um, what we later we stitch together the Voronoi cells. Um, then you get kind of polygons. Um, we know what points used to be in those polygons. From those points, you derive the, your parameters. You do a plane fit, so you derive your parameter, your normal vector, and your x y z. And you apply that to your polygon again, and then your polygon becomes a uh, 3D polygon. Yes, we started with we started with uh, tins. Um, the, the problem is with tins, you have um, uh, they look. Uh, uh, of course, tins and Voronoi's are, are very much alike in a way, um, but especially where they meet, you have double points. Like the point is either. Uh, part of one polygon or the other. Uh, Voronoi has fixed the problem for you. Any other questions? Any 
Yeah, the, the way we do it um, is, is just, calc just go take your 3D polygon and see how many points fit in. Um, if you have a very low, num low density of points fitting in, then you know something went wrong, uh, either in your input data or your process. Okay, our time is up. Thank you very much, Tom. We'll take five minutes break.